So we're joined by Mark Lester, thanks for joining us today, and we're joined by David, who's going to co-present today. So Mark, kind of, it was over a year ago now that I actually spoke to you here. It was celebrating 50 years since Oliver. Yes. Um, but one thing that kind of stood out to me in that interview, which we didn't really get to kind of explore, was your kind of unlikely friendship with Michael Jackson, in the sense where kind of how it came about and how you became so close. So I kind of wanted to um, okay. speak to you about kind of your friendship with Michael. So how did you become friends with, with Michael? Oh gosh, going back years and years ago, about 19 in the late 70s, Michael was still with his brothers. And I think they were, they weren't called the Jackson Five, I think they were called the Jacksons. And they were doing a tour of uh, the UK. And anyway, I got a phone call from Michael's manager at the time and uh, came through to my house, I was living in London and uh, the guy said, um, I didn't pick up the phone, my mum picked it up. And I, the guy asked whether my, I could meet, uh, Michael could meet me. And of course, yeah, you know, it was yeah. not a problem. He was staying at a huge hotel in London. So uh, we arranged a time and they sent a, one of these stretch limos, this huge <laughs> like black Cadillac things, which was great. Anyway, my sister was a big fan of Michael's. I, I kind of, kind of, quite liked his music, but I wasn't particularly a fan. Anyway, she wanted to come along, so she insisted. So we both turned up at the hotel, and he had the entire floor of this ho West London hotel, the entire floor with all these bodyguards around. It was like surreal. Anyway, knocked on the door, and I wasn't quite sure what to expect. Michael Jackson, whether he's going to be in a space suit, or <laughs> hovering, like levitating, or I don't know, I just didn't. Anyway, he answered the door, he was wearing a pair of jeans and a sweatshirt. And he came and gave me a big hug, gave my sister a big hug. We sat down and uh, we just became friends. We were there like, for about six or seven hours, just chatting and eating pizza. And <laughs> So was he actually a fan of the movie? Is that how the friendship came about? He, his favourite musical was Oliver. Wow. And yeah, so that's how our friendship came about. So you essentially grew up with Michael? Uh, yeah. Getting to know him, so you've known, known him for years and years and years. I've known Michael since I was about 17, 18 years old. So, did he ever come to, to Cheltenham to see you? He has been to Cheltenham. He has been to Cheltenham. He came on a cloak of secrecy. Oh, okay. And he came and stayed when I was living uh, another, on the other side of town. He came and spent, uh, I think they came up, him and the kids, uh, the three, his three children came, and we, um, he, st I think he stayed overnight actually, and we put them up in the house and. Um, yeah, it was like, it was so obvious that there was someone there because he had five blacked out the, uh, <laughs> SUVs outside with bodyguards and things in it, so it wasn't exactly uh, subtle. So, so what kind of thing did you and the King of Black King of Pop get up to when, uh, when, he, when he came to visit you? We just used to sit and watch movies. We'd uh, chat about everything under the sun, really, and um, all in, he loved fish and chips, that was his... One thing he loved, we, I'd stayed in the best hotels with Michael all around the world, Michelin star restaurants, and all he ever wanted was fish and chips uh, or Domino's pizza. <laughs> uh, stay at Adlon Hotel in, in Berlin, which is like a five star with a Michelin star restaurant in it. And I wanted to order some food from the restaurant downstairs and he, he said, oh, I didn't like anything that was on the menu. So we ordered Domino pe Domino's pizza, so about 10 Domino's pizzas turned up. I just couldn't imagine Michael Jackson munching on fish and chips. And <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We 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 had a competition to find out who did the best fish and chips, and then we found out that well, we 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 assessed that the Dorchester Hotel did the best fish and chips in in out of all the hotels and all the ones that we stayed in in London. That's an exclusive there to everyone watching. <laughs> um, kind of going back, I know you actually used to holiday, holiday with, with Michael. Yeah. So how often would you actually go on holidays and what, where, what kind of places would you go to together? Well, we, I suppose the, we went to Neverland a few times. I went maybe a dozen times to Neverland. My kids, I took my son there when he was very young and we spent a week in Neverland. And then I took my two uh, younger daughters there and we spent a week with Michael in, in Neverland and then we spent some time in Los Angeles. Perfect. I wouldn't have minded going to Neverland. <laughs> yeah. I think that's everyone's dream. It was, it was different. Yeah, it was great. So what kind, what kind of place was it like? Was it as magical as it looks on the TV and you see it? And... Yeah, I mean, when you arrive at Neverland, you, you drive for about half a mile before yeah. you hit through the grounds and then yeah. you hit a set of gates 
which are huge, like wooden things with on the top it says Neverland. Yeah. And then do they open? And then you drive around a lake and then over a bridge and it's all at night wow. it's all lit up and all the water's lit wow. up and fountains and everything. And he plays music in the garden, sort of like classical music. Yeah. And it's just beautiful. Anyway, you go over the bridge and then the house is on the right hand side. And it's like a, it's very kind of almost English in its style with a slate roof and it, it, it's um, big, a big, big, big house, massive great entrance hall. And then you've got on the other side um, of the driveway that's four guest cottages and that's usually why I stayed in one of those. Yeah. And when you kind of looked at Michael at Neverland, because I've seen various documentaries, he looked like he was always having a time of his life, kind of, yeah. you could see it in his eyes and his face. So what was it like when you spent time with him? Was he just kind of in awe and like enjoying what he's built essentially? And yeah, he showed me around Neverland uh, a few times. I mean, I've been, uh, having gone there for like the 10th time, yeah. he would say, oh, by the way, did you know I had my museum uh, where I kept, he kept all his press cuttings and everything? I said, no. Anyway, we, got, we drove in these little golf buggies across maybe about half a mile because I mean the whole of Neverland was probably the size, probably about the size of Cheltenham, I should think. Wow. <laughs> with all the land. I mean, it had many, it had many hills and everything yeah. in it. Anyway, so we drove and we, we, there was another building that um, and he took me in and he showed me all his, where he kept all his press cuttings and things. And then he showed me pictures of when we were kids there were american magazines that i was in jack wilde who was in oliver yeah. was awful dodger david cassidy donny osmond and uh, and michael and th there were all these um magazines with our faces in so he said i always wanted to meet you <laughs> in those days and i said well you know, we, here i am now <laughs> <laughs> so did you and michael ever go and play games then because i saw in uh, a documentary that he loved old school games and oh, arcade yeah, yeah. games and yeah, things yeah, like that. Yeah, Did yeah. you ever spend the day just playing games together? Yeah, well, yes. I'm a bit old for games, but <laughs> he, um, when my kids, uh, Harriet and Olivia, came and we spent um, a week in Neverland, and then we came back and we spent some time in Los Angeles and we were at a hotel called the Beverly Wilshire in the suite that was made famous by Pretty Woman, the film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We were in that actual room, which is oh, okay. like a presidential suite. And Michael sent out for some balloons that you can fill up with water. <laughs> and then they, Michael and my kids, his kids weren't there, I think they were back at Neverland, um, proceeded to throw these water bottles out <laughs> of the window. <laughs> and this guy walked past and got absolutely soaked. And then he was like looking up, trying to figure out where they were coming from. And then he called security and I'm going like, we're supposed to make supposed to be on a flight like late that day and I thought we're getting all going to get arrested <laughs> and I mean at times when you kind of see various programs with Michael he almost was always like a big a big kid a big child always liked to, to do different things but um, go, going through his life he had a lot of controversies uh, surrounding him in regards to his kind of relationship with children Mm -hmm. Now, what are your thoughts on that? Because those who kind of don't know him kind of say it's, it's terrible the way that he used to have children sleep in his bed. Yeah. But for someone who actually knew him like you, would you say it was just because he didn't have a childhood himself and he was reliving that in his adult years? Yeah, I think, yeah, exactly. And, and Michael was, he always thought of himself as being about 12 years old. He told me when he writes music, he, 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 become, he writes for 12 year olds because that is his kind of target audience. And he, I think he just, he just always thought, even as an adult, that he was a kid and having kids, having a big sleepover, there was absolutely nothing yeah. wrong with that. I mean, I didn't, it wasn't my place to say, look, actually in this day and age, it's a bit weird and you know, you shouldn't really be doing it. But there was nothing untoward, not, nothing uh, sinister about it. There were just kids that would, and he had they, not only, um, uh, kids that he he would go and visit hospitals and things and then bring them back to Neverland. I mean, not all these kids stayed over. Yeah. They had lots of cousins and they would all stay over. My kids stayed. I was there yeah. with, with, with Michael. And I've had Michael's kids. I've been lying in Michael's bed while he's gone off to make some phone calls. And I've had Prince in Paris uh, in my arms like that watching yeah. Disney movies. So it was, you know, it's just, it was just... Unfortunately, I think now society has deemed that you know anyone who's slightly different is is a weirdo or and poor old Michael yeah. got labelled with something that he he wasn't. 
because essentially the, the controversy and a lot of it came from the Martin Bashir documentary. Yeah. Um, and we watched that not too long ago together. Yeah. And one of the things that we pointed out, which we noticed it was quite a, like a, a strong thing to see, um, was when Martin Bashir asked him to like forced him to get up and dance and sing. Mm. And you could see he was he was very shy and he, he was quite like introvert and he was like, oh, I really don't want to do it. Mm. And he, he forced he proceeded to, to, to force him to do so. Yeah. Was was he always shy? Was he? Mike was very shy. Yeah. yeah. I, shy in, in, in a kind of, I think it was more that he didn't like to show off. Yeah. He, you know, I've met a lot of celebrity people and a lot, you know, there's some who are beautiful, lovely people and others who are really, you know, just, they show off, Yeah. you know, because they, who they are. And Michael wasn't one of these people. And I think that he, and I remember seeing that bit on the, on the um, interview as well, and I think Michael didn't like to be forced to do anything. Yeah. I mean, I spent a lot of time with him and, you know, he never really would sing. If I said to him, oh, Michael, you sing something, I would never ask him. But occasionally he would just feel very relaxed and he would start singing, whether it's one of his songs or uh, Nat King Cole. He loved Nat King Cole's music. He might sing something from Nat King Cole, but it was never, I never would force him to do it. And I think, yeah, in that documentary, because of his his, his, his his being sort of slightly more reserved, um, he wasn't an introvert as such, but he was he was uh, definitely a, a, a more shy yeah. on the shy side until he got up on stage and then he like a switch in his element. Element and then bang, he was Michael Jackson. I mean, with that interview, it was kind of, as a viewer, it was hard to watch because Michael seemed like a very private man. So he kind of let Martin in. I think it was Uri Geller kind of... Yes. recommended that Martin was a, a credible journalist. Um, yeah. And Michael kind of let him in to see his life. And it was almost like Martin had a, a, a motive going into that interview to kind of expose something and get this, this drama. And mm. it did. It went worldwide. Michael spoke about. Now, during that time when you watched a documentary that went out and it was in all the papers, did you spend time with Michael? Because I know it kind of, it really crushed him as a, as a person. His, oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, no, his, his trust was betrayed. By he he invited this man Bashir Martin Bashir into his house he, and he was very open with him and um, there I yeah I was with Martin Bashir when they there was an incident where Michael held his newborn baby up at, at the window yeah. and that was in Berlin and I was in the room when he did it and there was this oh big fuss about um, about that um, but Martin Bashir was doing the last stages of his filming in Germany. So I would, did see about, I was there for about two or three days with Martin Bashir. And do, well, that incident you just kind of spoke about was one of those moments that everyone remembers from Michael. So when he did that, were you kind of like, you know, what are you doing? Did What went through your mind? Because it isn't a, a kind of normal thing to do, to hold a baby out of a, yeah, but of a hotel. Yeah, in context of seeing it, there was a ledge right underneath. So worst case scenario, if Michael had dropped a little blanket, he would have fallen onto the ground. But, I mean, I remember throwing my kids up in yeah. the air when they were little. And how many times did I drop them? Never. Yeah. And, I, and he wasn't. He was just holding his yeah. baby. And he wanted to show the world this wonderful um, addition to the Jackson family. There was no danger yeah. involved. It was just the spin that was put on by, um, you know, the likes of the tabloids. And I think a lot of it sometimes is kind of like he didn't really have an advisor because when you've got those rumours and speculation going about you and then you kind of do, and do something that's seen as irrational as doing what he did, it was almost like there was no one there to say, Michael, maybe take a step back. Yeah. Um, and that yeah, was the yeah. hard thing. And it was like... You're absolutely right. Yeah, there that, wasn't. Yeah. Because, yes, you're absolutely right. Because if Michael had like a spin doctor mm -hmm. and someone who said, look, Michael, actually that's probably not such a good idea. You know, a lot of um, these sort of rumours and innuendos would, would never have ha happened because he would have been advised. So you're, you're absolutely right. He, he, a lot of um, his, his advisors were just yes men. But Michael was like that. And he went, he got through a lot of people because maybe someone didn't agree with what he was doing. So they just were out, you know, not, yeah. not that Michael was doing anything nefarious, but he, Michael didn't like to be told <laughs> that you know certain things were not acceptable he he didn't get it if he had Yuri Geller fell out with him for that very reason because Yuri told him uh, certain things about his life that Michael didn't want to hear and then the next thing was Yuri Geller was 
pushed out. So another made up that you know of? So I think probably did towards the end, yeah. but not to the same extent where you know Michael was Yuri's uh, best man when he renewed his vows mm. to his wife, and you know they were quite close and in touch quite a lot, but. Uh, Sadly, Yuri Geller is exact is is a, is an extremely nice, and he's a very cl- smart guy. Uh, but he he only had Michael's best interests at heart. So so when we talk about all these like controversies with Michael, do you think he essentially became like an easy target for for the press to kind of just get a story out there and? Yeah, absolutely. He was a dead easy target because he never denied anything. No. So as you were saying before. If he had a spokesperson who, who could have quashed any of these rumours, he, he could have stopped it there and then. Yeah. But he didn't. Because he didn't understand what was wrong in certain things he was doing, i.e. having sleepovers, having kids around playing with them, which you know may be deemed in this society as being slightly inappropriate. But he didn't see there was anything wrong with it, so he didn't seem to need, have the need to defend himself or even explain because he didn't think there was anything wrong with it. Yeah. And obviously, after the, the interview and the documentary aired, there was a kind of a quiet few years for, for Michael, mm-hmm. which I assumed he was kind of in, kind of um, on his own and didn't know what to do because of all this stuff. So did you spend any time when he kind of went recluse for yes. those years? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He went, when he went after the trial and he was found innocent on all charges, he then fled to, well, fled. He left Neverland because it kind of was tarnished. Yeah. Um, he went to um, live in Bahrain with the. Um, <coughs> excuse me. He went to live in Bahrain with the, um, the the Crown Prince of Bahrain, who invited him to stay, and he stayed in one of his palaces. So there were several oh. palaces all over, and that uh, Christmas we stayed with Michael. For, the, for about two weeks over Christmas, you know, he flew my kids over and me and my ex-wife, and um, we um, we we had a great Christmas over there. It's very odd Christmas at forty degrees, <laughs> <laughs> and Father Christmas coming in uh, in the middle of the desert. But uh, and then prior to that, before he went to Bahrain, he did actually spend some time at a place called Cliveden, which was well known for the Profumo. It's been on TV just recently, the Christine Keeler thing. I don't know if you've watched no, that. Anyway, Spring Cottage was where it all happened with Fumo's massive firm. Um, he's got a VIP in. coming in now. <laughs> here comes, here comes Louis. The most beautiful dog. Louis, come on. Come in. Come on. <laughs> Gotta be on this interview. He'll come up with his own accord. <laughs> so, oh, that's all right. There we go. Good boy. So, as I say, um, in 2009, it was announced that Mike was actually c- having a comeback tour yeah. with this. Is it? Did he ever discuss that prior t- with you? Kind of like, you know, I want to get back into this, want to do some live shows. Was there any a conversation with you? Not really, because I'm not his business manager. He had, um, you know, he had been uh, off the live circuit for some time, and none of his children had ever seen him live. So he wanted to, yeah. for his children to actually see him on stage performing because they'd only watched videos and DVDs of, of him prior to that so he wanted to actually be there live for them so he yeah he announced his tour and I was with him actually the day that he was went up to the O2 I went in the coach with him and they, they had a minibus and they, they drove us and we were almost late actually because um, the London traffic and we couldn't yeah. get through and we had a really tight time window because Tina Turner was on that evening and they had to um, clear the front of the O2 to get all the security in for Tina Turner. And uh, we literally made it within about 10 minutes of the window wow. closing. That's very and then tight. Michael gets up and goes, you know, this is it, this is the tour, yeah. this is it. Yeah, and that was the last, inter- well, the, one of the last times he was ever seen on, on TV. So how excited was he to be, to be doing a, a, a tour? So he must have spoken about that a few times. I think he was excited and nervous at the same time because there was quite a lot of pressure on him. Yeah. You know, but they obviously he was a fifty year old or nearly a fifty year old man then, so they obviously scaled back the amount of um, dancing that he would have yeah. to do. But there were lots of other dancers as well. So Michael was doing not to the extent that he would have done, you know, when he was in his twenties and thirties. So, you know, it's choreographed. Uh, so yeah, he was excited about it and um, 
a bit nervous at the same time. Yeah. Because he didn't want to let his fans down. Well, of course. I was say, this, obviously it was tragic because he never actually got to fulfill these, these shows because yeah. he sadly passed away. Now, when you found out the news, for someone who was so close and kind of knew the real Michael, not the Michael that was in the press and, you know, that's all around the internet, you knew the real Michael Jackson. So how did that affect you when you found out that news? Uh, it was awful. I mean, I, I remember someone texted me and said, have you seen the news? And I switched on and saw that it was about 10 o'clock, I think, UK time. And um, first of all, Michael had suffered a like, exhaustion and the next thing he'd had a heart attack and then Jermaine came out and said he died. And it was like, oh my God, I can't take yeah. this in. And I, I, I stayed up all night thinking that I was like in some sort of bizarre dream. And I didn't want to go, my kids were upstairs and they were going, it was a school day. So I didn't want to go and tell them anyway. I knew that they would know when they went to school, so I yeah. told them in the morning and they just burst, all burst into tears. And did you have any contact with the family? Because obviously being so close to Michael, did any of them kind of reach out to you? Did you reach out to them? Uh, I had some contact with his brother, um, Jermaine, and um, Randy as well. And um, a, a couple of the, I think it was um, Tito's wife is very helpful, because um, I went out to the uh, memorial service in Los Angeles. Yeah. And do you, after now, do you kind of still have contact? Because I know you're the godfather of is it all of Michael's yeah. children. Yeah. Do you still have contact with any of them now? I haven't spoken to them for ages and ages. Um, it's just like, well, there's a, there's a distance, obviously, in miles. Yeah. And there's also the family a bit were, obviously, because they were very young. And so they sort of went into lockdown almost and sh tried to sort of shield them from the outside world. So it was very difficult to get yeah. So there was also a lot of controversy surrounding his passing as well. Mm -hmm. um, did you did you watch any of the trial with um, I think uh, Conrad Murray? Did you watch? I did, and I think you know the trouble with Murray was the fact that he was a paid employee who was giving obviously injections that were not really suitable. But I you know if it would hadn't have been him, it would have been someone else yeah. who would have would have done it. He was being paid a lot of money to do it. And unfortunately, um, I think Mike was taking other things as well. And it was just, you know, he just suffered an overdose. But if it hadn't been Murray, it would have been someone else. So I, I kind of didn't, I felt a bit sorry for him. He was kind of made a scapegoat over the whole thing. But then again, you know, ethically and professionally, he should, he should have just walked away. But yeah. he was giving, being paid like, I don't know, Hundred grand a week wow. or something, so yeah, there's a bit of a carrot. And what I wanted to kind of speak to you about is when Michael passed, you were catapulted back into kind of the limelight because a lot of people wanted to interview you not only about obviously Michael's life, but there was a a lot of speculation, a lot of rumours in regards to yourself and Paris Jackson, and you know why are you the biological mm. sperm donor? And I've seen you were on all these interviews and TV now. For someone who was so close to Michael, did that affect you? That like you were actually, instead of going on a, a TV show to actually celebrate his life, talk about the legacy he's left behind, and in fact you're actually talking about these rumours, did that ever frustrate you? Yeah, a little bit, I think, because unfortunately, you know, bad news, people want to read bad news rather than want to read good yeah. news. So like this Harry and Meghan thing, yeah. everyone wants to demonise these, these poor kids, really, you know, and they just want a life. I, for whatever reason, but you know, uh, unfortunately, saying lovely things about people doesn't sell newspapers, and but saying horrible things about them or or, does, or, yeah. or slightly tarnish things is what I've, uh, allegedly the the tabloids think people want to read. But so, where originally? Why were they bringing you on the show to talk about it? Where did the statement come from? Was it something that you said, or was it something that was just thrown I, around? Yeah, it, Yuri Geller was came to me and said, look. We know about all these sperm yeah. donors, of which there probably were a dozen people, um, including um, another child actor who sort of remained nameless, yeah. um, and various doctors and, and, and things that have been selected. And uh, Yuri said to me, well, look, the story is gonna, gonna break. He said, there's two ways you can do it. You can let them break the story and then they'll put whatever spin on it or you can tell your side of it. So I said, well, it's probably better if I come forward and just say mm -hmm. what I did 
and then I can tell my own narrative rather than it being taken out of context or, or t twisted or whatever. Yeah. So it, essentially, it was just kind of saying I could potentially one of twelve. Well, it's, that's what the yeah the press said. Yeah, but I mean, I came forward and I said, well, yeah, I, okay, I was one of several people. I don't even know how many people there were. Whether they just got it all mixed up in the test tube and. I know, but it's a lot of things to say. Was it ever like a... That's what Elton, Elton John did. Like, did you ever feel like quite privileged? Oh, I was chosen to, to actually do I that? I guess so, because um, apparently he, yeah, he selected like sort of top athletes and mathematicians. <laughs> and, so it's all a bit like, a bit, a bit like Frankenstein. <laughs> she seemed to turn out all right. Um, yeah. <laughs> And so, would you say, from Michael's parents, you said that they kind of went quiet after his death and he didn't really get to see the children. Mm. Would you say some of those stories that broke out in the UK was to do with them not maybe wanting you over there? Was there any kind of that between you both? I think that there was an element of protection put in place. And, because um, Michael was a very private guy. Yeah. And, you know, all this uh, nonsense about how close the family was was completely untrue. Michael didn't, hadn't seen somebody hadn't seen somebody for those five or six years. Wow. He was in contact with his mother, but maybe once a month he might sort of pop in. So it wasn't like I they thought were, they were very close. You no. from what you see on yeah, yeah no, no. no, not at all. Uh, and then obviously after his death, all the brothers were um, suddenly they were always you know there for him. Yeah. I mean, I remember one time in, in particular, I was in the hotel, and uh, his brother was on Greek Brother. Jermaine. Yes, Jermaine, yeah. Jermaine and I said to Michael, oh, that's, we were just sitting down, we were having a glass of wine, watching, eating fish and chips probably, and, and watching something on TV. And I said, oh, your brother's on Channel 4. <laughs> and I said, do you want to watch it? He went, no. Wow. Well. <laughs> he wasn't the slightest bit interested. So you, you must miss him absolutely incredibly anyway, being, being a close friend of yourself. Yeah. Is there anything that stands out the most about him not, not being able to pick the phone up and to call him? Yeah, because I mean, we, we used to get a random call. So if, every time Michael came to London, I'd get a call. He'd be like, my, my. He'd call me like two o'clock in the afternoon and say, oh, I've just landed. Um, can you pop round and I'll see, can you come around this evening for dinner? And I'd be like, mm, Michael, I'm like two hours away. I'll <laughs> see if I can. And if I couldn't that night, I'd, I'd clear my diary and I'd go up. On the week. A lot of the time we went up on the weekend, I'd take the kids and we'd spend like a couple of nights with them and when he lived in Cliveden at the um, hotel there, we went virtually every weekend for about three months oh, and he actually, we had the spring cottage which is attached to Cliveden as, uh, it's, you're talking about, a, you know, it's a stately home which is now yeah. a hotel and this um, room that he used to get for us which I mean, it must have been that. probably about 10 grand a night, I should think. Oh, wow. We had our own butler that came down in a wow. Bentley <laughs> without food. Better than a Premier Inn, then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, we saw in the, uh, in the documentary, it was quite extravagant with, with his yeah. purchases. Um, I think it was the, the Martin Bashir uh, the interview, and he was walking around and he was like, I have that, I have that, do I have this yet? And he was, he was picking out loads of different things, I have this, I have this, yes. I have this. He had um, questionable taste, I must say. Because <laughs> some of the stuff was just awful. I think we had one bit, it was a Tutankhamun like, yeah. tomb. Yeah. They bought it, I'll have one of them. Anything that had sort of gold and gilt on it, yeah. for some reason, he liked. He had these one, these, he had a, a piano in, this, in, in Neverland in the front, in the living, well, one of the living rooms, and on it was this candelabra that was hideous <laughs> with like little clocks on it and, and oh, it was awful and it must have cost I don't know hundreds of thousands of dollars but oh, wow. you know he liked it because it was Louis XIV or yeah. and he had a lot of this Louis XIV but it wasn't even real Louis it was like imitation but done but then sold on them really expensively in these particular place in Las Vegas um, that he, they must have seen Michael coming in that's it. They, they, they can we retire for a, for a year because he'd spend he'd spend a million plus in one go so did, did Michael have certain like mannerisms that you'd always find like really funny because we, we pointed out in the, in the Martin Bashir <laughs> documentary you get going you like to get someone's attention that made, really made us laugh oh yeah actually now you mention it he yeah, had like no concept of other like, people's jobs like, he just kind yeah. of wave his finger and <laughs> <laughs> it's just he was, yeah, yeah, but actually that's funny you should say that. He, um, he was always incredibly polite to everyone, you know, whether it was uh, a cleaner coming in to do the room or, or any of his fans. And he's a very humble guy and very, um, 
very polite, but uh, yeah, I remember one time we were up in, I think we were at the Dorchester in, in London and um, there must have been five or six hundred fans outside in Park Lane just yeah. waiting to see and catch a glimpse of him. I said, oh Michael, you should go up to the window because, you know, he's like, oh, yeah, I will in a sec. So anyway, so he goes up to the window and they all cheer and <laughs> scream and light bulbs and flashes going off. Anyway, oh, this is, so anyway, so I, I went up to the window and I just put my hand up like that <laughs> through the curtains and they all started screaming. <laughs> <laughs> it was my dad. It was him. Yeah. Um, another documentary that we both watched was actually Louis Farouk. Um, yes. So at the time, yeah. it was kind of Martin Bashir, Louis Farouk, they were trying to get the, yeah. the scoop with Michael and it was obviously Martin that got it. Um, now, Louis was desperate to get a glimpse of Michael and, and the real Michael and he actually interviewed his dad yeah. um, for money. And that was for me, um, I know it was for, for David, it's actually hard to watch because his dad was kind of it came across was living off Michael's name and mm -hmm. he said some things that weren't very nice in there. He was talking about um, Louis asking about him beating Michael as a, a child and it was like it meant nothing to him. He was just kind of, yeah, you know, I had to do that to get the best out of him. Mm -hmm. Did Michael ever open up to you about his childhood and how tough it was? Yeah, he did tell me that he had a hard time with his dad. But the thing is, with, I guess, of that time, um, things obviously look more different now. Um, and rightly so, but you know, he, I, I think Joe Jackson, his dad, would have been quite stern with all of the family because mm. he wanted to make them professional. So he probably took it a bit too far. So if Michael was probably a bit naughty and said, "Now I don't want," to, I'm not singing today. He probably got a smack around the ear or something, which is obviously yeah. you can't do these days. But um, yeah, so he 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 did have this. Um, he towards the end though, he. Um, had a much better relationship with his father. Because when you look at it kind of on paper, he's grown up a child star with his brothers. He's then gone solo and become the biggest star musically, you know, in the world, essentially. But that you kind of look at his childhood, if you're getting beaten, you're getting kind of pushed the way he was pushed, you can kind of understand why he was a little different. He was a little, you know, not like your everyday guy. Mm. He, um, trying to live, relive his childhood yeah. kind of thing. And mm. that's kind of sad when you see someone, because everything I've watched, I mean, we've both kind of said, we just as people believe his innocence um, with massive fans of his music and it just you see how much he just wants to give he seemed like someone who just wanted to to be generous I don't know if you've seen when he signed pillows and <laughs> shut them out yeah. the window of the hotel yeah. like he, he, he was he, he, you're absolutely right he was an incredibly uh, sensitive and giving chat he was very very sensitive and to the point where you know fans would um, he would get selective fans and he would yeah. invite them up into into the into the to the hotel room and we would sit and chat and you know then they go off and they'd be like oh my god I've met yeah. Michael Jackson and another yeah. lot would come in I mean I went to Michael with Michael to Tokyo and um, there's a load of the English fans actually were the most loyal out of all of, around the world mm -hmm. and we had about a dozen people who actually dropped everything at a moment's notice followed us to Heathrow Airport and. Uh, Next, they were on a flight. They didn't know where he was going. Like, Where's he going? This is going to Tokyo, and they like literally didn't have anything, no clothes, change clothes or anything. And they were sitting in the lobby of the, of the hotel when Michael and I were upstairs. Um, and Michael was doing a uh, meet and greet thing in, 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 in Tokyo over a couple of days. So he asked me to go with him. So I did, and um, but you know we had like a dozen fans down just sitting around twenty four seven in the in the lobby and they were actually living in the lobby and these Japanese, they're very reserved people, the Japanese <laughs> don't know how, what, how to deal with this. So, so that must have made you feel incredibly special to, to, to be a friend of his when people have always wanted to meet him and things like that. Yeah, um, yeah. Well I'm still in touch with a few of the fans that um, yeah. when I was with, with Michael and this, they text me and give me updates about things that are going on and etc etc and send me photographs. I get um, photographs from time to time that I haven't seen of Michael and I together and um, he took all an example of his, his kindness all these kids that come over and they were kids in their 20s early 20s who had just literally dropped everything flown to Tokyo and we went to Disneyland uh, Tokyo so Disneyland there and he hired a bus and he brought all the fans and they closed Disneyland for us. Wow. <laughs> and uh, he took all the fans there and let them 
Um, what a moment that was. And then went round and met them all. Because like, we saw that in the, um, was it the Louis Theroux documentary where um, he's got loads of kids and they're all kind of walking around Neverland and he's giving them like ice creams. Yeah. Like, and it's like, did he kind of just get a busload of them, bring them over and then spend the day making their day special for them? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So he didn't have to do that, but he no. did, you know. And a lot, that's a lot of what annoys me is the all the sort of uh, anonymous visits he made to children's hospitals and, yeah. and uh, burns units, especially um, orphaned, orphanages and things that was never ever picked up in the press because all they wanted to do was hear about wacko Jacko and yeah, yeah. him living in a hyperbaric chamber or trying to buy the elephant man's skeleton and all this nonsense. <laughs> but uh, one thing I do want to tell you is... Um, that moment we were talking about where he kind of went yoo-hoo and we found it so funny we were drunk at the time we were going to get it tattooed on us but honestly Mark I do appreciate that you've given us the time and that to actually hear your side because like I don't know if you've seen the documentary Leaving Neverland yes there's so much negative stuff about Michael Jackson out there and you never well, get to hear don't get me going on that one but, uh, what were your thoughts on did you watch it I, well I, I had to because I had to do a critique on it for um this morning in, in, in London with um, Lorraine, I think it was. And uh, I mean, it's, it was just awful. And, you know, without putting too fine a point on it, um, I don't know, legally, how on earth they got away with, you know, saying such things which cannot be proven. Or defended. Or defended, well, sorry, yeah. defended, yeah. yeah. It's but, most awful. And it's been, so much of that stuff has been disproved, though, um, by, um, you know, people who've investigated it. Yeah. I'm not talking about just fans. I'm talking about, you know, media people yeah. in the States who've um, basically taken everything apart and gone, well, actually, that moment didn't happen. I mean, mm. there's a there's a point in the in the documentary where one of the mothers of the kids is going, oh, we love Michael so much, and he's so lovely. And then I found out he's abusing my kids, so why on earth would you yeah. be so happy about? And, it, you know, all the, just didn't. A lot of inconsistencies up. within that afterwards. Indeed, yeah. yeah. Um, but for both of us, you know, to be fans, to actually kind of sit here with someone that knew Michael, spent a lot of time with him, to hear uh, your side of how loving, friendly, generous, and kind of out there that he was, it's nice to get that point across. So we really thank you for your time. I know Sorry. you would have loved thank that as well. Much, yes. well thank, thank you very much, yes. Thank you very much. Thanks to our star, Louis. <laughs> yes, he's been doing good, isn't it? <laughs>